Morning all. It's Friday. It's Easter. It's a nice time. Snowing outside makes a change, doesn't it? So what am I going to get on with today? Well, it was supposed to be building up the transfer case. However, uh, the other day I got a, um, a load of parts in and it had the new uh, intermediate shaft in that I was waiting for. And I took it down to JP, the machine shop, who was going to put a bushing in the transfer case because it's pretty worn. Anyway, unfortunately he's in the same place as me because I've got this 110 here stuck on this lift for the last few weeks. And his, he has got uh, some work set up in his milling machine, which took him quite a long time to set up, and he's waiting for a special tool to come. So he's stuck. So I thought to myself, well, I've got to, I can't put off doing this differential much longer. Let's get on with that. Now, I'm not going to strip down this diff. I've taken the differential out. I've cleaned it, inspected it. It's fine. Uh, I'm not doing anything with shimming. Now, the reason for this is that I'm against a tight budget as well, but the main problem with it was that the uh, pinion flange here was very, very difficult to turn. You couldn't turn it with both hands. So somebody had put the preload too high. So what I'm going to do is, I've, I've got this kit here. I'm going to open it up now and I'll show you what my intentions are. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Of course, there's something different about these. This is supposed to be a sort of an upgrade kit. And there's the seal. But notice, it's got like a, it's a rubber seal. Now, originally they were like this. It was a leather seal. And you must soak these in oil for at least, you know, 12 hours or so. To let the oil soak in so it actually works. Don't never put the, the, oil, uh, the leather seals in dry. Uh, also comes with a lot of nut and washer. But this is strange because when you do the leather seal, you get these, uh, well, you're supposed to put these paper gaskets behind the seal. However, when you look at the two seals, like, uh, I'm not going to take this out of the packet, but there's the, there's the front of the seal and there's the back and you can see there's a nice shoulder for those paper gaskets to go onto. Not on this one. It's going to cut them to death. Uh, all I can assume is on the outside of here there is a little bit of sealer. And you can see how different that seal is to most others because this lip is going to run inside here to stop any dirt. And of course it's got a massive great flinger on there to stop any dirt getting in. I think that's one of the problems with those axles, that the dirt gets into them and chews them up. So I'm going to fit this. Hurrah. But um, I'm going to go down to JP because I haven't got a piece of tube or a socket big enough to tap that in nice and square over the pinion, if you see what I mean. But I, just, I, I want to just say something here. <laughs> that... I usually do not strip differentials down or play with them or anything. If they've got a little bit of play in them, okay, at the back, and, you know, it's not the end of the world. But they're a pain in the ass to shim up. And they're not very nice to work on, on the vehicle. They're far easier to take the axle off. Again, ac uh, budget constraints ain't going to waste any time doing that. And another thing, if I... In, in 25 years, I've only replaced one front differential because it was broken. Now, all I do is go to another car and pull a differential out that's good. That's, that's all I do. You see, the simple reason is that it's just not cost effective. Like, and perhaps you know in the UK too, that if you've got a busted Salisbury axle, well, it's cheaper to just go and get another axle off an old 110 and put your brakes and bits and pieces on it than it is to strip down the differential itself replace the crown wheel and pinion and mess about with shimming and buy dial gauges and height gauges to do it properly it's too much it's very very expensive i just looked at the crown wheel and pinion price and the cheapest was 430 pounds in the uk just for the crown wheel and pinion because they're ground together if you see what i mean when when they machine them they grind them together and herein lies a problem with this job you see I'll show you in a minute the pinion. 
But uh, once you're committed to change a crown wheel and pinion, you think, well, I might as well change the bearings as well. And that's more money and time. 100 quid, just go and get another axle, shove it in. <laughs> That's all I do. I just put, like if the front diff goes, I just put another one in. Off of the used car. Just make sure it's okay. Bang it in. It's lazy, isn't it? But it's time's money. You know, I mean, if you, put, if you were to put new bearings and all set up and things like this in the, in the back of a Salisbury, it's going to cost you just a thick end of 550 quid. You know, expensive. You'd buy another axle for that. In fact, you could even buy a better one with disc brakes on, for example. Makes sense, doesn't it? So it's a bit of a cop-out, but anyway, we're gonna get on with it. Now, what I've got here is a tool I made. I made this yesterday, and it's a flange off uh, the gearbox, uh, the transfer case output, which bolts, should bolt, <laughs> Onto here. I've got a I've got a little bit of grinding to do because it's just catching on here. Oh, there you go, you go around there. I've just got a bit of grinding to do. But the, the thing is I can use this. This is the clever bit. You're supposed to buy a special tool for it, but I haven't messed about with that. Um, it's big enough to get the socket in to tighten the nut, and I can jam this against the chassis or whatever. But the other thing is, it's 24 inches long, two foot. So <laughs> I know it's not metric. But the reason for that is that I can put to test the uh, preload on the bearings. I can put a spring balance on the end, and this is two foot. So, say for example, I don't know. I haven't looked at the figures yet. So, say for example, it's twelve pound, foot pounds uh, preload. Well, it's two. So I only need to put six pounds on here on the on the spring balance to get the preload. See, if if it gets if if I want a bit more leverage on it, I can slip another piece of tube over the top and really reef it down because we've just got today well we're in the same shipment these chaps these are the collapsible spacers that go on the pinion so just let me t let me find the pinion and i'll show you, show you the nightmare i've had i'm a bit buggered for space today i can't get in my shop this is the pinion I've just slipped on here the original spacer and I'm going to tell you something interesting about that in a minute. So there's the original setup. What happens is you put your flange thus and when you tighten the nut up it will put a, a, a preload between these two bearings uh, but it takes quite a lot of force to tighten them down and once it's done that's it set. And really when you change the nut and things like this, you should really always redo the preload, which is a pain in the backside, but you know, you can sort of count the teeth and things like this, but it's got to be set right. So what was the problem? What's the problem? Mike, you're always complaining. Like complaints department, isn't it? Pay attention of this. Look at the end. Now this, I've taken some pictures of this and I'm going to put a still on whilst I talk now. The picture you see now is when I took it out and cleaned it. You can see that there's hard, you can hardly see any numbers on this whatsoever. However, going off the picture of the Land Rover workshop manual, here, you can see it should be clearly identified with some numbers and this isn't. It wasn't until I put some uh, Sharpie pen on it and rubbed it into the markings, I found out that it was etched on the end. What am I going on about? Well, if you can see in the diagram, the, the, the bearing, the, the end of the, uh, the end of the pinion here could be marked with a plus or a minus, and you can calculate the shims that go behind here, in and out, if you see what I mean. Now it says, if there's no markings, you don't need, uh, you just need to put it set to the height gauge. This gets complicated because I'm not sure about this. <laughs> I'm honestly not sure. Uh, I could see on here, when I look at it now, it's marked 6327 and a, and a 5 at the bottom. But it doesn't say plus or minus, and this is my bit of a dilemma. 
So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to work out the, I'm going to put it together, because I've got about four of these, and good thing to do. I'm going to put it together, and I'm going to uh, measure the, the preload, put, set the preload up, and I also am going to put the differential in, and I've got some of this stuff. <laughs> it's not makeup. This is the proper stuff. This is called uh, gear marking compound. And you paint it on a few gears, and then you turn the gears to see what the contact path of the, of the teeth on the gears are like. Because really, really speaking, if I'm not changing the bearings, I'm not changing the gears, and I'm not changing anything, it should technically be set as it should be. Now I know we're going into realms of not fantasy, but technicality stuff, and this is one of the reasons why I don't do them. But I noticed whilst I was setting this video up that something's not quite right. These are a pain in the ass. They're sort of they're very they're a good caliper because they've got you can read them well, and also they put the the thumb piece here and the battery goes in the top. Whereas some of them have got a battery on the side here and the the thumb piece. And it's got the battery cover and that drops out and the battery drops out but these eat batteries like nobody's business and they're constantly resetting so i've set it to zero this time well <laughs> let's get these measurements right because i thought oh, where, how come the new one's shorter so let's go back to this one 27.58 and this one is 2391. Now just let's check that because look, you see I put it back to zero, put it close the jaws again. Five millimeters out. It just just crackers, man. So look, it, it, it's 28.99, so we can call that 29 millimeters. <sighs> Annoying. You see, it's it's sometimes when you push it back, it doesn't read right, so I don't know what's going on here. So I've got to compress that just by a, a tiny bit, not much at all really, a millimetre. But it takes quite a bit of force to collapse that bush. And you see it's given us a head start here by putting a, a, a boss on the outside so it, it will expand upwards. So, better get on with that then. Now first of all, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put... Uh, the pinion in with the bearings but without the sleeve without, without the collapsible sleeve set it all up uh, just so I can measure the height off here against the gauge now I'll, I'll get the gauge out now and I'll show you so this is the height gauge made by GP and we're using this one here the smallest one and it got into this magic caliper it's, it's 30.93. Why is that important? Well, what we're supposed to do is put this on a flat piece of metal, you know, on a flat surface, and with your dial gauge, you're supposed to measure the height off here. And then we do something interesting. This is the interesting thing. With this set at the height of the height gauge, we put this on the end of the pinion, and we measure the height both sides of the bearing carrier in the, the axle casing. I have to be careful with that one because it's kind of expensive. So what I mean by the carrier is the corresponding part to this uh, holder here, this, this bracket you know, carrier that's on the inside of the gearbox. So in effect, what you've got is that carrier imagine this is the gearbox it's a bit dark under there because I brought me bloody light but you've got to measure off here and here average it out and it should be the same height as the pinion height for this block right so that's what you try that's that's really in a nutshell what you're trying to get at uh, I, I suppose it's easier to do than explain but I'll, I'll try and set it up but um, again, I'm sort of stuck for light, really. But never mind, you'll work it out. Um, 
Yeah, I bought this little gauge, this little uh, height gauge. These are really, really good. I wish I had one years ago. Because, well, let me take it off here. A square one was going to be a little bit too big, I thought. But the thing about this one is, it's only got one adjusting knob for everything. So no matter where you want to put it, tighten that one adjusting knob up, it tightens up here, here, and here. Brilliant. And it stays quite rigid. The old fashioned type, which I've put away now for good, was a bit flimsy when you wanted to uh, change the height of here. Now this has got a, a thumb wheel on here, so you can do very fine adjustments. You see like that, look? See when you turn that? It turns the turns here for, to get your fine adjustment. It's brilliant. It wasn't very expensive. I don't know, 50 bucks or so. But the thing was, it's small and it's light. The other one was a bit clumbersome. And of course, because you had to change so many uh, settings, that seemed to be good. I don't know what the hell I'm on about. <laughs> Thank God it's Friday. Eh? Um, so let me put the, put the pinion in first with no bushing, no seal, and I'll find out what the real preload is.